She comes to China, she gets me, we go on a plane for like 16 hours from China to Ireland. Emotional damage, this is, <laughs> this is a trauma that I still carry to this day. My mom put me in the school, said to the principal, here's Stephen, there was not one person who could speak Mandarin in miles. You're in for a very special treat today because we have a conversation with the one and only Stephen He, the creator of the original Emotional Damage meme. Emotional damage. But he's so much more than that. He's a filmmaker. He has a monster YouTube, monster TikTok following, and he has a full TV show in the works that's coming out in March. I'm really excited for it. In this conversation, we talk about his real emotional damage from childhood. And obviously we had to touch on social media and its effects on mental health. It's time for the checkup with Stephen He. Stephen He. Hello. Welcome. Oh my God, I'm finally here. Are you excited? Bro, I, I can't believe I'm in this building. It, it's, yeah, I'm you, very you're honored. You're faking it though. You were, you knew you were in the building because we just did our, our TikTok war, which you unfairly beat me in. Can I tell you a secret? I'm continuously nervous the whole day. Why? <laughs> Who are you? Is it because Bear? You're scared of Bear? No, it's because I, I, I watch your channel a lot. And so, I'm, yeah, I'm just nervous. Oh, well, that's awesome. Here. Okay. Thank well, you. don't be nervous. The <clears> goal <throat> is to have a good time. Oh, thank uh, you. And we want you to come out of this experience <clears throat> saying that you also want to be a doctor <laughs> and potentially make your parents proud. That would be, wow. If you if you manage to change my entire career tonight, <laughs> that'd be very significant. So tell me, uh, <clears throat> tell me what was it like when you misheard what your parents wanted from you when you were a child? misheard yeah what do you mean <laughs> well your parents said become a doctor yes, and you 100%. heard actor and you became an actor so that's what i assume yes. happened i was the best chinese kid that did exactly <laughs> what my parents wanted me to do and did not get a degree in anything that could earn me any money what was your degree uh, in my degree is called um, acting and global theater wow that is a bachelor's degree from london okay uh, and then i came to were there any other asian participants in this program ever <laughs> It would be funny if I say no and I forget I actually had okay. a classmate who's okay. Asian. Not Chinese. Not Chinese. Okay, not Chinese. Yeah. The reason I ask is because <clears throat> traditionally that is not 100%. a widely accepted and celebrated craft. Am I yes. right? <laughs> and I agree with them now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so now you're on team parents? Yeah, 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 100%. Because, okay, okay I, I need to like... I want to share this this insight because okay, I didn't have it and it hit me like a bus. Yeah. Uh, the insight that how many actors actually make minimum wage, let alone a living, mm -hmm. let alone paying rent and having a family. Um, I was under the impression that I'll get a degree, I'll become a good actor through all the teachers teaching me, and I'll go and get jobs. Yeah. No, that's not what happens. No. So uh, I was... Um, I was I lacked that insight that I wish I had back then. Where oh, Do you think most actors know this going in? Or is this something that hits everybody at some point? It, yeah, uh, it's not a common enough insight. I think it, really? not enough people know it. But isn't the reason why your parents don't want you to go into acting is precisely because of that reason? It is, yes. Okay. <laughs> so like they tell you, but... So uh, I, I I guess I've known about the one in a million thing that mm -hmm. it's you got to be lucky you got to do all of that, mm -hmm. but thinking about it as a starry eyed teenager mm -hmm. is not as impactful as getting rejected three thousand times. Got it. So it's okay. the bus that hit me that drilled the the mm -hmm. insight into my head. So it was the rejection, not your parents telling you, "Hey, you shouldn't do yeah, this." Yeah, yeah. Man, yeah, we need to. True. But you're saying you are unhappy that you didn't listen to your parents you wish you would have listened to your parents that uh, oh well, i think the current version of me is my favorite i'm very glad wow, okay. that um i went and i gave it a try mm -hmm. and that i was absolutely <laughs> slapped out of the audition room thousands of times i'm very glad that i i can kind of continue on a journey with those experiences living in me mm -hmm. so i'm proud of it and i would not change a thing so how did you go from, like, I'm actually curious specifically, yeah. what has been one of the worst auditions that you went on? Where <laughs> either the casting people were savages, or yeah. you did a really bad job, or an amazing job. Some cool story from your casting Oh, days. it's it's a lot. <laughs> I know you have something good. It's a lot grimmer. I So, for example, I've had a lot of these experiences that I, I hope other people don't, but it's happened many times where I'll get an audition. Like, I'll submit to something first. Mm -hmm. um, I'll get an audition 
and then I would spend half an hour learning the lines. I spend one hour traveling. That's to it. Location. Half an hour, and you learn the lines. Yeah, you're that like, fast at it's memorizing. Like two pages. Is that's that not, a... No, that's hard. Is that right? I've tried to try out for these things. For real, I can't memorize. Dude, it. I, you are. You have great memory. No, I don't. I couldn't do it. Uh, really, okay. I couldn't do it. Uh, I, props. Okay, sorry, I interrupted. This <laughs> that's good. Um, then uh, I travel for an hour to the audition room. I sit in the waiting room for 25 minutes. I go in. Um, the assistant says, there's your mark, come rolling, go ahead and do your thing. I perform to the best of my ability, and then I exit. And I swear I'm not exaggerating a word of this. The casting director behind the table does not look at me once. Oh. Not once. No eye contact. Yeah. She doesn't know what I look like. Wow. After spending all of that time working for nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was that. I've had... I've is that had, is that the norm? Is that what they're <clears throat> supposed to do? Like, are they supposed to like see what you look like on the film, not what you're like in person? Or is oh, this rude? It's rude. It's rude. It's rude. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's why I say I hope like anyone who wants to be on, I hope you don't have that. But experience. it's gonna happen to them. Probably. Yeah. Uh, you know, there there's just occurrences sometimes where the the system is ineffective. Mm -hmm. Like here's an example. Um, <laughs> more often than I would like to admit. They'll ask a hundred actors into an audition room to audition for a part that's already cast. Mm. So there is no purpose. What's the what, what is the value of so doing for that? example, um <laughs> for billings? Like are they trying to make money? Is that not necessarily like justify no. their jobs or something? Oh, oh, usually it's not about that. Usually it's more like um if I make a production, I want to cast this guy. He says yes, and I'm like, okay, cool. He drops out a week before. Oh no, he we have no leading actor. Mm -hmm. Let's let's call in hundred actors in, and then audition day comes and he says he's back again. Oh. So it's a complete waste of time for those hundred people that I called in. Got it. So um, you don't even get to audition. They just say you came for no reason. Bye. They don't. Or they say like that you. to your face. They don't say that to your face. Oh. Uh, and as a hopeful actor, you know you're thinking uh, rather delusional things like, oh, now I'm in their books and they have heard of me and they'll call me back. They, they don't call me back. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. How many auditions do you think you've gone on? Jeez. That so in uh, I'll briefly explain how like an actor um, starts off. You apply to to castings, and then when you have an agent, your agent does the same thing, like submits you um, to castings. <clears throat> so when I was when I just graduated, I would wake up in the morning and I would submit to twenty jobs, and I was so so hungry that I was willing to lose money for an opportunity to act. Mm -hmm. I was willing to travel to like Kentucky to do a Shakespeare play and cover my own travel and lodging wow. uh, and lose money just so I can be on stage a couple of times. And I did that. I did that many, many times as wow. well. Um, so the submissions, I have submitted a uh, over 3,100 wow. submissions. And, and how many of those did you go to? Oh, the, the, prob like the, the percentage of those yeah. that call you in, I would say... One to two hundred. Okay, so you it, did one to two hundred. How yeah, many of those were I rejections? I'm. It's, I think through my entire career, I think I landed seven. What? <laughs> oh, that's tough. No wonder you're discouraged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's hope you're discouraging some other folks right now. Well, from, it's it's an insight, you know, whether it's good or not. It's the fact. So, so is that why <clears throat> you've made the uh, sort of pivot move to leave? the traditional gatekeeper world of Hollywood yes. <clears throat> and come into the world of social media, YouTube, TikTok, have your giant viral moment with emotional damage, yeah. everything else that you've been doing. Is that what led you here? Yes, it, it was. Um, <clears throat> I needed I needed to pivot because I, I saw what was happening around me and what I was personally experiencing. And I was like, yeah, this is not ever going to pay my rent ever. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to kind of think outside the box. And at the moment, it was because I had noticed an imbalance in the marketing industry mm -hmm. where, yeah, I love how you're nodding because you know, yes, <laughs> this course. is exactly what we do. <laughs> um, that um, marketing in new media was extremely effective, way more effective than traditional. Mm -hmm. And so the logical kind of um, progression was uh, brands and companies would shift more of the marketing budget into new media. And that is a large, large amount of the TV industry's revenue. So upon noticing this, I, I kind of formulated a prediction that if I could wield millions of viewers, then that would give me leverage in the casting room or even straight to the producer. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so you didn't view it as a money making scheme yet. You were more yeah. so saying this is a way for me to get into the thing I still want to do. Yes, okay. I, I saw it as a strategy mm -hmm. so that I can maybe go into a casting room and say, "Hey, if you wouldn't mind three million extra viewers, cast me." Yeah, uh, that com completely backfired. That did not work <laughs> at all. Well, it's the same reason why I got into uh, sort of social media and medicine. Mm -hmm. I viewed it as a way that if I started my practice, I could show patients what I'm capable of yeah. doing and they would come in to see me in the really? office. And now we don't even want that to happen. <laughs> yeah. I want to keep both worlds very separate. So we both started off with aspirations wow. in one direction, but kind of found a fork yeah. in the road. Oh, yes, that very much happened. Mm -hmm. I, I remember it was... is. It was exactly 220 videos in. Wow. Um, and I'd been making nothing. I'd make, make, make me one or two dollars a day off of YouTube AdSense. <laughs> okay. You were their premiere uh, member. I, <laughs> yeah. I had one guy that watched my videos, probably. <laughs> it was me. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now I return the favor. Uh, and there was one day where a video popped off and it got, it got a few hundred thousand views and it was making its way up there. And all of a sudden, in one day, I think I made 50 bucks. Oh, that blew my head off. I mm. could not believe I'd made 50 bucks in one day because that could pay for lunch. It could pay for everything. And keep in mind, I was an actor making nothing. <laughs> <clears throat> I was, you know, my mom and dad were helping me pay rent. So that okay. was huge for me. And then the next day, I think I made $300. Oh, so I was like, wait, wait, wait a second. What's going on? And the next day, I think it was 800. Um, so what video is this? This was, I think it was a video called Asian parents going through your room. Okay. <laughs> Very specific. <laughs> yes, where they just roast everything okay. about their child. Um, so that was when I realized, wait a second, there's there's money in this, mm -hmm. um, and it continued on, and it became a career that I could finally like tell my mom, hey mom, I, I have an earnings now, um, I can pay rent and I can do stuff like that now, <laughs> which yeah, it would have never been the case in like thirty years if I had kept auditioning. Um, that started growing, and then it grew to a bigger business, and now. The opposite has happened where I can no longer kind of afford to audition anymore mm. because um, there are, I have a team that make the video with me and I need to take care of my people. And if I give, say, 100 hours of my time for free to auditions like I did last year, no, that was the year before 2021, then I would lose a lot of revenue and I wouldn't be able to take care of my team. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting how, yeah, I'm 100% flipped that... This career is more fulfilling. You get to do what you want to do. You're not um, at the mercy of, of someone above you that tell you, no, you're not good enough. You're not handsome enough. You're not tall enough. Mm -hmm. um, and you actually get to make fulfilling content and entertain people. How do you balance that uh, with not having to please a gatekeeper, someone above yeah. you, an exec, but having to please the algorithm or whatever the audience wants out of you when yeah. it's not what you might want to do? Oh, that's such a great question. Wow, that's a really great question. And it makes me think too. Yeah. I, I think, um, yes, every creator meets the struggle of the algorithm wants you to make this, but it's not necessarily what you want to make. It could be for many reasons. For me, it was like <laughs> I had made 64, I think right now about 64 Asian ad sketches. Okay. And I'm running out of ideas. <laughs> sure. But they're what gets the views. So um, so how do we navigate that? When I make a general sketch, it's not about how my upbringing growing up in China. Um, the views are significantly lower, mm -hmm. half, sometimes less. Um, I th I have a friend, Ian, who, who told me this piece of advice that may be helpful to others as well, which is he calls it the 2-1 rule, that you do two things for the algorithm, and you do one thing for yourself. This is from Entourage. Is that right? Yeah. I, is that a book? No, no, no. Entourage is a, a TV show about making it in Hollywood. This is a show you got to watch. It's <laughs> That's literally, why I didn't make it in Hollywood. <laughs> it's about a guy who from Queens and his friends, how they all move out to LA yeah. and become, well, he becomes the famous actor, but uh, his agent would tell him, you do two for, you, uh, two for oh. them and then one for you, but you uh -huh. have to do the two. Yeah. I don't remember if that's the right ratio he gave, but it was Ari Gold, I think, who gave the ratio. Oh, gotcha. Okay. He, he, he was actually based off a real figure in Hollywood. So yeah, that's interesting that Ian pointed that yeah, out. So yeah, so it'll be the experiment this year. Uh, and the, the, the scene is constantly shifting as mm -hmm. well. So like recently, um, I've started making shorts and that, that was an interesting pivot that uh, really freed me um, because <clears throat> to write a 60-second sketch 
is quite a different story from writing a two minute, three minute sketch. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden the process is different. What I need in it is different. The amount of joke is vastly different. Mm -hmm. I could do a sketch without progression, without plot, without development. <clears throat> so um, that was a, a really nice kind of burst of creativity um, that I think I needed after doing a lot of the same sketches. Did you find yourself burning <clears throat> out? How long did you do uh, before you became, you said 200 videos before you went viral? Uh, I, yeah, the progression is I had made about 120 videos before I got my first video with a million views. Okay. Uh, and the others were like 4,000. And how long, in how long of a period of time was that? <clears throat> Oh, that must have been a year. I okay. think it was a year. So a year of making 120 pieces of content. Yes. Then one does well. You get a million <clears throat> views. How long has it been since that moment? Oh, then it went down. The, oh, I, I it went the, down. Yeah. So okay. video number 120, I remember this so well. It's a video that I made, made uh, satirized how my mom used to throw slippers at me. Okay. Uh, and then it went down back to about 5,000 views for another 100 videos. Okay. And these are these are shorter because I, I started on TikTok as a mm -hmm. strategy. Um, at video number 200, uh, that was when the money came in for the first time. Uh, then from then, I grew to about 2, mil 2 million subscribers on YouTube long form. I didn't make sure it's then. Um, that might have taken another 40, 50 videos. And then emotional damage happened. <laughs> okay. And the world just exploded. Okay. How did you come up with emotional damage? So it was a sketch. I wanted to write a sketch about... <clears throat> <laughs> and for those who don't know, by the way, emotional right. damage is a tagline or joke that you have that if someone, uh, you do it, you explain what it is better than oh, I okay. do, because I don't want to misrepresent your catchphrase. It's like me, it's like you trying to figure out what the heck pee whoop means <laughs> or whatever. There's a means. meaning? There's a meaning. See? I did not know there was no, a there's meaning. No, there's no meaning. <laughs> <laughs> Just a random sound I make. But. Oh, I love that sound. Uh, emotional damage is a meme. It's sort of off of a sketch that I made called When Asian is a Difficulty Mode. Um, <laughs> I had made the sketch. It was not about emotional damage. But somebody took that about three-second clip and started putting it behind videos of like a roast or a joke. Um, and from then on, it had been put behind hundreds, and then it was it's in hundreds of thousands of videos. It got turned into a sound song remix um, and uh, now it's kind of commonly sent among peers as a personal, like, as an inside joke thing. Yeah. yeah. send it to each other. And it was actually in one of my uh, YouTube videos. It was. Yeah. Sick. Thank <laughs> yeah. You. Well, no, I think you saw it because a lot of people yeah. tagged you and they're like, oh my God, look, you're in this. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. We can connect. And yeah, then we yeah, ended up meeting uh, at the YouTube event. At the YouTube event. Yes. So over this period of time, uh, like 100, 200 videos, mm -hmm. a, lo a lot of time goes by. How does your mental health and physical health change during that time? Oh, that's a really interesting um, change. It's actually more exciting and passionate than, <laughs> than now. <laughs> Wait, your health thing. was, you're yeah. taking care of your health. You were more passionate about it then? Also, oh, what I mean was like um, in the beginning portion before I had made money, mm -hmm. That was fun. Mm. Uh, it didn't feel like hard work. It didn't feel yeah. like I had to force myself to do anything. No stress. Yeah, it was genuinely fun. Creativity. Yes, a oh, full freedom of creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, more pieces started to come in. You mm. know, a team started to come in and uh, other concerns. And of course, the monetization side, the sponsorship side, and the side of the algorithm that have to do certain things to please the algorithm and the audience. That came in and it, it started... Um, making the process a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. Like I miss the days where I would go, that's a great idea. I write it, I shoot it, I make a great sketch. Mm -hmm. Today, it's more like at any time, I'd have five sketches in production at the same time. <laughs> yeah. you know, one's in a revision, one's in the edit, one's to shot today. Uh, so the process got more complicated for sure. Mm -hmm. And I find myself... Um, spending too much time in the non-creative stuff mm. like the paperwork the business the running the the companies learning about taxes i, yeah. I don't like any of the this. boring stuff yeah yeah um so uh, yeah, next step i guess is to learn to um to have that handled so i can go back to the creative mind more than the paperwork. so mind. when you're not in the creative mind is your mental health suffering yes the, oh the, this is a large um thing that happened to me in October last year, October of 2022, um, while well, I was producing a series called Ginormo. It's going to be out March 25th. 
so what happened in that period was um, I was running too many things. Mm. I was running kind of three large projects. Project number one, I was editing Jino. I thought I could do it myself because I've edited videos, but I heavily, heavily underestimated it. Um, so I was editing at that week, the worst of it, 12 hours a day. Wow. And uh, simultaneously, I was doing a lot of work with the producing side, like um, the press uh, preparing content to launch, preparing a schedule, uh, looking at um, venues to host screenings, so the producing side of things. And on top of those two, I had my six channels that I had to make content for. Um, and I remember there was one point where things got bad. Because of my kind of lack of ability, I couldn't run those three things at the same time. Well, because you're human. Yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> this isn't your lack of ability. Yeah. <laughs> this is your truth of being a human. <laughs> yes, I could, I could shadow clone myself. Yeah. I need to learn that. Uh, so all three projects started failing. Mm. Um, the, the edit was way behind which caused a cascade effect into, I had to call Good Morning America and say, I'm so sorry, can we push the launch date? Can we hold the story? Um, the, the press side stuff wasn't getting done and my channel was three weeks behind. Mm -hmm. All three verticals had failed. And for the first time, and I'm 26, for the first time in my life, my body started not being reliable. Mm. Like I had very often moments where my heart would beat very uncomfortably to the point where I had to stop. I had to like stop editing, take the time to so like breathe. Anxiety, out. panic? It could be. Uh, it could be. Mm -hmm. And also for the first time ever, I started to lose balance. That that really worried me. I'd be walking or going to the shop and all of a sudden I'd miss a step. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm scared. Something is not right. And it's because you weren't there in the moment? <clears throat> Your mind was elsewhere or uh, you were physically out, like head spinning, room spinning? Not necessarily room spinning. Like disequilibrium? Yes, for for glimpses, for like one mm. step if I'm walking somewhere. Uh, and uh, just a general, a little bit of a nauseous feeling. Mm -hmm. I remember very clearly, there's one day, there's one day I had to, <clears throat> my laptop wasn't uh, capable enough of editing. I needed to get a, a more powerful laptop. I walked to Apple and that, that was in the thick of it. That was when everything was going down. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I remember... I would lose balance every now and then, I have to catch myself from a step. And then I was in World Trade Center, New York. People started coming up to me. And, and I got a, like a, a group of about seven people talking to me and taking pictures. And I felt like I could fall at any second. Oh my God. So I must have behaved very strangely in front of them. <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, that I, I told my mom about it. And I was like, this should not be happening. I hope Something your mom encouraged you to get checked out. Yes, yes. Okay. She encouraged me to, um, to take a step back. And so I, I took the loss, you know, I, I, um, I, I delayed the show for three months, mm -hmm. um, cost another like $30,000 to hire on editors to do what I couldn't do, which is funny because they do a better job anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned that from then on, I'm like, okay, I've, I've got to make an effort to not abuse my body too much. Did the symptoms fully resolve when you made those changes? It got a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely got a lot better. The, the losing balance thing went away. Mm. Now I, I don't lose the balance. Uh, the heart beating uncomfortably thing, it was still there for maybe a week mm -hmm. and then it slowly got back to normal. Yeah. Isn't yeah. it incredible um, how the human <clears throat> body creates symptoms huh. based on what is going on situationally around you? Yeah. And me as a doctor would never be able to know unless I run tests or we change your situation. Mm what is the cause of these symptoms? Because, you know, if I, yeah. if you ask me, what are the symptoms of a stroke? Yeah. I could say it's someone walking and then all of a sudden losing their balance and then not knowing exactly where they are or feeling out of it. That could easily be a stroke, but it could also be a migraine, but it mm -hmm. could also be a panic attack. Yeah. It could also be sleep deprivation. Right. So like, that's what's difficult about medicine. If you're practicing it in the day, in the way that it is practiced in this day and age. Mm. Meaning right now, most times you walk into a doctor's office, it feels like you're in assembly line. It's like mm, an express yeah. way where patients just move in and out, in and out, get them in and get them out. Yeah. So you come in, uh, the way that doctors practice these days, oh, you have this symptom? Okay, so that's yeah. treatment uh, B, imaging C. Okay, here you go, bye. Versus 
I got to sit with you. I got to talk to you. What's yeah. going on in October 2022 that you're feeling this way? Is there anything else going on? Are you sleeping well? And only upon painting this full picture of however long it took us to get to this full mm -hmm. conversation, can I possibly even give you some reasonable thoughts of mine yeah. as to what to do next? But no one gets that these days. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't make sense for a doctor to do all of that in 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, forget 15 minutes. It's just even from a patient perspective, I, I don't know if you, did you end up seeking help for this? Like, did you go and get checked out uh, by a doctor? Or, in or December, no? I went, I did get checked out and I okay. did blood tests. Okay. So you did yeah. do some tests. Yeah. Did you feel rushed by the doctor or you were comfortable? Oh, you have no, a good relationship that, that with them? That was in Ireland, by the way. Oh, really? Um, Why so Ireland? I'm from Ireland. Okay. okay. <laughs> I should have started with that part. Okay. Yeah. I'm Irish. Uh, I, when I was eight years old, I was born and raised in China and then immigrated to Ireland. Wow. Okay. Um, and as my Irish accent is going to start coming out. <laughs> uh, and then grew up between Ireland and China. Uh, 17 years old, I went to London for, for the bachelor's degree and then I came to New York. Okay. So I went back home for Christmas, uh, saw a doctor. I felt very well taken care of. I don't even think there was anyone after me. So I had wow. any time, okay. as much time as I wanted. So apparently we need to shift our model more towards what's going on in Ireland, <laughs> yes. which I know nothing of. So. But you're <laughs> yeah. saying it's good. It's a positive experience. Yeah, I, I did not feel rushed. Yeah. Okay. And uh, everything came back. You're good. You're healthy. We can I, expect I millions of more videos from you. <laughs> you can definitely expect millions of more videos. I don't think I've gotten the test results back yet. But uh, What, from so December? January. Okay. It was in January. It was in January. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah, I should have a okay. I should check my Well, email. I hope you should check it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if there's any okay. questions, feel free to send them my way. I can, oh, thank you so I much. can answer general questions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty incredible that you started feeling those effects on your health quickly. Uh, mm. I also know that in your past medical history, you've had a surgery uh, on your eyebrow. <laughs> yes. Tell me about that. Oh, this will be the first time it's in public because they've kind Ooh, of been hiding this. Okay. There's no need to hide. It's, it's perfectly human. Well, exactly. Uh, yeah. That's why like, we need to break the stigma and I appreciate you doing so. Awesome. Awesome. So this was from 2021 Q4. Uh, it was, a, it was a quite a stressful period because of deadlines. Mm -hmm. Previously, I'd been making content to however I want, but suddenly in December, I think I had like 13 continuous deadlines that Oof. I had to hit. Um, and of course, you know, things go wrong all the time, like edits are late or a video is, it needs to be reshot <clears> or <throat> revised. So <laughs> in about halfway through that, um, the, the period of work, I had a bump started developing here, right here. Mm -hmm. You might I, see this. On your... Uh and my right, right eyebrow. eyebrow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't know what it was. I didn't take it that seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the bump got infected. Mm -hmm. It's and like it a got, folliculitis. I don't know what that word means. <laughs> infected hair follicle. Yeah. Oh, I think that's yeah. what it okay. was. Yeah. yeah. Um, it got infected and in like three days it puffed up to about the size of an olive. Wow, that's big. It was big. very bothersome. Okay. Very bothersome. And hard to make content with that. Yes, uh, and I did the most Chinese thing ever. I slapped a bandaid on it and just filmed anyway. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, no one noticed. No one asked questions. Yeah, a, lo a lot of people did. A lot okay. of people were like, "Why is he wearing a bandaid?" So okay. this is the answer because oh, wow. I, okay. I had a I had an infected hair follicle, I guess. Okay. Um, I I I went to the doctors. I think I did. I went to the doctors. They gave me antibiotics, and it came back down mm -hmm. um, to an unnoticeable little bump again mm -hmm. but it's noticeable if i touch it but you can't see it or anything yeah um then <laughs> twice after that in periods of stress it has gotten infected and just become huge really uh, is it because you pick at it like when you're stressed like are you picking at oh never skin? no oh I, no okay. i became like like traumatized i still to this day don't really touch that area okay. of my face because <laughs> okay. i'm so scared of it you know doing the thing um <laughs> and this is a funny story we shot Ginormal in September in LA uh, and it was this huge thing that cost a lot of money and like uh, we had over a hundred people work on it. So it was very important. And I was like, what are the chances it pops up during production? <laughs> <laughs> Did <laughs> it pop up? Wouldn't it be so funny if it popped up in this time? So this is a true story. Um, it, was an, it was an eight day shoot uh, across three weeks. Uh, we survived through the eight days, and the day after wrap, it, it inflated. popped up. It became a huge wow. Yeah. So I got so lucky. So you had like a stress cyst. <laughs> it was yes. Oh uh, yeah. At the time, I was I thought it was luck. I was like, 
luck would have a hilarious sense of humor if it decides <laughs> to do me now. Yeah. Um, but then I had the surgery to to remove the whole thing, and the doctor, the surgeon, did tell me that it had a opening where bacteria can make its way inside the thing. Mm -hmm. And when I'm stressed, my immune system comes down, bacteria makes it in and it gets infected. Mm. Uh, so I learned that, oh, actually, there's actually a pattern to this. When I'm highly stressed, it, it does the thing. Interesting, interesting. It, it's <clears throat> almost like, not 100% because it's a different cause, but like a cold sore oftentimes comes up when you're sick or yeah. stressed. And this thing just happened to be not a cold sore, yeah. but a bacterial source instead of a viral source. Right. It just so that's so interesting. Gets infected. I'm wow. so happy to have But now it you've removed. had it surgically removed. Yes, it is removed. Uh, RIP stresses. <laughs> it's gone forever. Yes. <laughs> Go to hell. <laughs> I hated that stress. Wow. Sense. Okay. So th that is a theme that's been happening um, quite lately, and it's caught me off guard so fast. What What's the theme? That's uh, the theme of the theme of my body kind of just having things going wrong. <laughs> You're 26, thing. nothing's going exactly. wrong. Exactly. So I'll describe I'll describe um, the things that I notice. Uh, <laughs> for my whole life, I never had to think before I did movements. Mm. If I needed to roll down the floor for a video, I'd roll. But <laughs> the last year has changed that. Now, before I do a lot of movements, I have to go, okay, so... Is my neck okay? Okay, it's grand. Is my, you know, whatever. Okay, okay it's grand. Okay, let's do it. Uh, before every video now, I stretch, which is the saddest thing that my editor has to watch. What do you mean saddest? <laughs> this is the most productive, proactive thing you can do. Like, I'm celebrating like, this as a physician. Oh, thank you. It's like, I wish I could be as carefree as I was last year and mm -hmm. do everything. Um, but now that's happened. And the other thing is, I, I believe I have a pinched nerve on the back of my neck. Mm. Um, it's been there for like two years now and it's gotten better and worse, probably affected by stress as well. What would happen is uh, when my neck would be like in a certain movement, I'd feel a shoot, mm -hmm. like a like a sensation. Um, Paresthesia, we call them. Okay, uh, all in my right arm. It didn't last, it just flashes. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, it got, during the stressful period, and this is like two days after the general shoot, I did a very simple movement that I always do. I'm at my bed and I lean on my bed. Yeah. Very simple movement. Dude, something happened and I felt a huge shock. It was like someone punched the nerve. Mm -hmm. uh, the the feeling of the, the tingling. What did you say it was called again? Paresthesia. Paresthesia. Okay. Yeah. The paresthesia changed. It became something different. I It became very painful. And um, I didn't move it. I didn't know if I could move it like, mm -hmm. for, for a minute. It was 60 seconds. I was just laying there still because I was going through the pain. Um, and then two weeks after that, I couldn't move my neck. Wow. So till this day, it still has that paresthesia uh, in, in certain Well, paresthesia moments. is what you're feeling, that weird sensation. Okay, yeah. Yeah. The shooting itself is actually, again, I don't want to make a diagnosis because I don't know the full picture, okay. but it sounds a lot like something known as cervical radiculopathy. Okay. Where you have the vertebrae in your neck, which are called mm -hmm. the cervical vertebrae. There's different sections of the vertebrae going up and down your back. Uh -huh. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. Okay. And the last one's the coccyx, the little tailbone. Okay. Um, but on top, the cervical ones, you have nerves that come out mm -hmm. after each vertebrae. Okay. And those nerves go and they give sensation to uh, and movement to the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. Now, the ones in the cervical area obviously are the ones that go down your arms and give sensation and muscular movement to the arms. That's, in fact, how you're able to move your body, feel things, temperature regulation, all okay. of that. Now, if the vertebrae, for some reason, go into a spasm, whether it's because you slept wrong, you were in a weird position, you were cocking your head weird, uh, uh. because you were stressed, you were carrying your weight uh, with your shoulders shrugged up, yeah. um, you can create such a position that those vertebrae, those bone, put pressure on the nerve, therefore bother the nerve to send these weird signals all the way down, radiating down the, the length of the nerve. Yeah. So that's my suspicion. That's a terrifying thing. It sounds it, scary, but it's it treatable at the source. So, which is at the which vertebrae. Which is at the vertebrae, okay. likely. Again, it's hard to know without doing all the tests and all, oh. but if it, if it is that, it is at the vertebrae. And that can happen as a result of something functional, like... Mm -hmm. You held your neck in a weird position. You had something around your neck that you were wearing that made it uncomfortable. Or it could uh -huh. be anatomical, which could be uh, a disc bulge, uh, a growth, a bone spur, all these other things. And those uh -huh. are the least likely options okay. in many people, especially a young person like you who's otherwise healthy. Mm -hmm. But 
you, you don't rule anything out until you sort of get a good picture in examining a patient. I see. Okay. That was a very long-winded explanation about neck pain. No, it's that radiates down very the scary. <laughs> it shouldn't be, be scary there. because it's treatable. There's okay. a lot of conditions that cause uh, what you're describing as like a neuropathy, which mm. is like pathy in medicine is like a pathological condition, something wrong. Okay. Um, neuro meaning nerve. So a neuropathy yeah. that goes down the, the arms can be a, a common symptom for a lot of patients that have Lyme disease, diabetes, mm. and they can't get rid of it <clears throat> treating their neck because it's coming oh, as a result of an issue at the nerve. Okay. And okay. that's a very different image than what likely you were experiencing. Right. I think and that becomes here. trickier. I see. It, it, I do feel neck movements have a, a great impact on yeah. it. So. Which means that, um, that there's a term in medicine called reproducible pain. Okay. And generally speaking, when we say yeah. pain is reproducible, that's a mm. good thing, generally speaking. Okay. Because if you're telling me you have chest pain mm -hmm. and then I press on your rib mm -hmm. and I can reproduce the pain, mm -hmm. that means it's likely not cardiac, it's not your heart. Because mm -hmm. it's likely the muscle, the tissue, yeah. the bone, things that are not super serious. Gotcha. Okay. Um, if you're having uh, pain on the other side and it's reproducible mm -hmm. when you take a breath, but it's because it's reproducible, I know it's more likely to be the rib rather than the lung tissue. Gotcha. Okay. So the fact that yours is reproducible, yeah, oh, if I do this neck is. movement, something happens, yeah. it's more likely coming that from that as a source rather than something happening at the nerve itself. Oh, the, okay. That's good. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> so I hope I can give you some reassurance from that Thank you. aspect. Oh, there's another way it, it kind of affects me. Um, in sports, mm -hmm. I very often get caught off guard with, usually it's a reaching movement. Mm. Um, I play badminton and I've recently kind of started learning tennis. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Dude, it's, it's terrible, but roughly every session I play, it happens like once. Okay, what happens? Um, it would be a movement. I'd move quite fast and I'd generally be like, I'm reaching this way or this way or any way. I'm reaching. I'd feel the, the attack. The stinger. Yeah, the there. stinger. Yeah. Uh, and the stinger usually stiffens this part up. I presume mm -hmm. that's like it trying to protect itself. It could be. Okay. Again, hard to know because also the brachial plexus is in this region, which is the, mm -hmm. the grouping of nerves that starts splitting up and giving sensation to the rest of your arm. Okay. But it's something happening there. How did you get into racket sports? It, uh, it's very popular in China. Like okay. Growing up there, uh, when I was- But you didn't grow up in China. I did. I did. I was born and raised in China. But then how old eight. were you when you came? Oh, eight. Yeah. And I mean, you didn't grow up in yeah. China. Oh, and then I had a separate <laughs> three years. Like, oh, okay. So you went back. Yeah. 12 to 14, 15. I like I lived in Russia until I was six. I didn't grow up in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's fair. I guess I grew up like pretty... I've lived in China more than I've lived in any other country. You're an international yeah. soul. Yes. I have been, I have gone to many places <laughs> okay yeah so it was living in china uh badminton was the most popular thing everyone mm -hmm. played badminton i came um kind of to the west in ireland it was very little in america i found it as an interesting thing it's like the networking center of chinese people no way <laughs> I've, so, are you in a league no in a club it's oh, very club. casual there's no tournaments or competitiveness okay um it's more like a certain group of people just show up and have fun okay uh, there's no one keeps scores okay um but uh before i found it very late on because the pandemic kind of stopped everything mm -hmm. so i found it four years into living in new york mm -hmm. i had i don't think i had any chinese friends but uh -huh. then I discovered a badminton club and all of a sudden, like, <laughs> I know everyone You're like, now. my people, I yeah, found yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the only place I speak Mandarin now. I was like, I love it. I go and I I, um, I chat with everybody. Um, and were they aware of your uh, skits and your work? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they okay. were. <laughs> okay. Yes, they were. There were a lot of moms bringing their children there to meet me. Oh, that's awesome. That was absolutely adorable. And then how did you make the transition to tennis? Uh, to t oh, tennis was very recent. It was because I had been in LA um, and it, tennis being a very common sport there and mm. also in my field of film and television, um, just a lot of producers that I became friends with played tennis. So okay. I came, I went along. Uh, it was very difficult at first. I could not hit the ball really being hard. a badminton player. Um, but uh, I enjoy it now. I think I, I do get a bit more of a soreness in my shoulder. Mm -hmm. That's probably a pretty common thing, right? Yeah, very common thing. Yeah. I mean, also I feel tennis... I mean, much like other sports, like, like golf, it's mm -hmm. very technique focused. 
yes, where people yeah. think that they have to be super strong to, mm-hmm. but it's more about the technique and how you use your whole body right. as a unit as opposed yeah. to strength, just strength just and speak. like overpowering this thing. Because that yeah. goes quite wrong in tennis very quickly. Yeah, uh, yeah dude, I've, yeah, a lot of the, the nerve things did happen in tennis. Like, oh, interesting. I, uh, when you're picking up a new sport, though, mm-hmm. weird things are are gonna happen to your body. You're gonna you're gonna be in sore in places that you were never sore before. That's so. <laughs> that's that's like kind of a, a typical response because your body is adjusting. It's almost like when you're a newborn, mm-hmm. not a newborn, but when you're young and you're learning to walk, yeah. and your body's with each step and each failure is sending new signals to learn and uh, which muscles yeah. to grow, which muscles don't need to grow. And all of that process happens when you're on a tennis court. So like That's so cool. Okay. what's cool is nerves actually expand and you get better control and activation of certain nerves the more you use them. So this is why practicing is a thing. Exactly, yeah. Also, it's like neuroplasticity okay. of the mind that it's able to reshape itself. Like they always say you can't regrow brain cells, but you Mm -hmm. can reshape the way that your brain is designed. Like different parts of your brain, depending on which ones you use and don't use. That's why the ones that are, uh, have lowest rates of Alzheimer's dementia are the ones that keep social connections alive, that are physically active, because we see that using the brain helps rebuild and keep those structures youthful. It's pretty cool. Oh, that is so interesting. Okay. There's a few parts of that that I find very interesting. Um, The social thing the pandemic kind of did this to all of us where yeah. our social life was cut yes. and it was restricted. Um, and that's when I kind of started my content creation. In the last year, I made friends for the first time. Um, I made friends with fellow creators for the first time who, for the f- like no one else got what I was saying. I <laughs> okay. would tell like, you know, my mom about retention rate and it was like, she, she would have no clue. <laughs> yeah. But then I found a group of people who got everything. Uh, and that did wonders for my happiness, for my mental health. I felt great. Well, you found a community, social support. Yes, yeah. I, I very much appreciate, appreciate communities. Yeah, that's normal. Yeah. That's like that. We all seek that sort of not just approval, but mutual understanding. Mm-hmm. It, it's very difficult when you go and you share your worries or concerns with someone, yeah. and even though the, they, they might be nice and say they understand, mm-hmm. if you feel that they're not being genuine in their understanding, yeah. it doesn't feel real, your brain knows. Yes, I bet it does know. Yeah. So what's the connection between the um, neural building of those pathways mm-hmm. and mental health? Is it the same thing? Well, it's part of it. For example, in mental health, one of the biggest factors that decides whether or not you're going to have a good outcome, meaning a good outcome that you will not hurt yourself, that Mm. um, it will be a short-lived experience with this mental health situation, is your social support structure. Wow. So part of what I do as a doctor when someone comes in with a concern uh, of a diagnosis of general anxiety disorder or um, major depressive disorder, Mm -hmm. is right away hammering out who's their support structure, who do they lean on. And that not just goes for their benefit and Mm -hmm. the decrease of disease burden, but also their crisis planning. For example, Mm if uh, I'm worried about them potentially going to a dark place, I would ask them, if you do go into this dark place, can we create a plan? Who can you call? So okay. that you don't even need to think yeah. in that moment. You say, oh, I'm feeling this way. This is what I'm supposed to do. And we have a plan in place. And that all stems from having a good social structure around you. And um, the unfortunate reality is so many of us have a broken <clears throat> social structure or have mm-hmm. been hurt by others mm-hmm. where we don't trust many other people or don't have great mm-hmm. friendships. And as a result, we struggle because loneliness is the true pandemic that's going on right now. Not that others aren't as well, but that's the one that is very universal, especially in the digital age, because we feel like we're more connected, but we're somehow connectedly disconnected. Yes, yes. And we talked about that earlier when we were saying Mm -hmm. how everyone is fighting each other on social media and there's groups uh, going into tribes against one another. Actually, I'm curious to ask you this when it comes to mental health. Yeah. Do you ever have people write negative things to you? Or uh, example, you know, you do a stereotypical mm-hmm. Asian parent. Does yeah, anyone get yeah. upset at you for doing that? Or do you own it? Oh, that's pretty funny. No, I own it. Because yeah. 
there is nothing wrong with the way I speak. <laughs> exactly. Simple fact. It's your own experience. Yeah. Um, but I, what I find quite funny, and this is a, a new thing coming to America and seeing, you know, uh, it would be strange. I would consider it strange coming from where I came from, is that the people that would type comments saying they're offended, none of them are Asian people. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, so I'm a little bit confused here. What's uh, what's exactly going on? Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, I'm, I'm new to the country, so I'm still learning about everything. Why do you think that is? <clears throat> Why do you think it's not Asian people? Like, do you think yeah. it's uh, like a savior complex that's going on? <sighs> or am I going that's too deep point. with it? I, I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, I completely do. And hmm, I can kind of see a perspective where there are people who mean harm, bullies, racist people. Um, there are people who mean harm that kind of uh, use stereotypes as a way to harm others. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because of that pain that many have experienced, maybe that is what the bad taste is mm. in some people's eyes. Sure. Uh, whereas in truth, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the way we are, with the way we speak. And uh, I don't want to give power to those bullies. Mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's my answer for that. No, that that's very <clears> fair. <throat> and I, I, like you, like to take yeah. a charitable thinking approach to it mm. and think that from a lack of knowing the culture, because there may not be a part of it, as you said, that the loudest voices that you get in the comment sections are usually not ones from your culture they believe that this could be detrimental. They get worried mm -hmm. and with good intentions mm -hmm. are now creating a problem. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a perspective. That is not valuable, basically. Right, it doesn't help anyone and I don't think it should be the case. Yeah, yeah, because I think ultimately it stunts our ability to have conversation, discourse, mm -hmm comedy to laugh at ourselves in fact what do you take uh, like you're basically a comedian these days uh, yeah. on social media <laughs> yeah. what uh and in film what uh what's your take on the state of comedy in general oh well it's very different around the world uh mm -hmm. the united states is in a very unique spot that i do not see with many other nations where uh, a culture how would i put this into words um People are losing the ability to laugh at themselves, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and it's not anybody's fault because I know it comes from a place of possible hurt. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, no one's to blame. And it's uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing because if you're just trying to protect yourself, I 100% understand that. Um, but I do have a ex kind of an extra caution that I have to put onto um, all the comedy that I write and uh, to consider a lot about, okay, from what angle can someone get offended by this? So you actively like, think about that when you make content? Yes, yes, all the time. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah all if, the time. If you didn't time. have to think about that, would your comedy be different? And how so? Uh, like, here's an example. If I made comedy sketches in China, it would be a whole different story. <laughs> it would be a whole different story, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, why? You would be more free to make more jokes? <laughs> Yes, I think I'd be more free. I think there would be more things I could satirize. Wow, okay. So one thing that I try to do is is individualize um, all the all the satire that I make. Mm -hmm. So I'll give an example. Um, instead of making fun of Asian fathers, I make fun of my father. Mm. Instead of making fun of failed actors, I make fun of me, the failed actor. Mm -hmm. um, so f every the butt of every joke has to be me. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if I was doing this in China, I'd make fun about you. I'd make fun about <laughs> everyone sure. else. So I think that's the main difference, that the butt of the joke has to be me and me alone, mm -hmm. not other Chinese people, not other young people, not other actors, not other... You Do know. you view that as a positive <clears throat> thing or just whatever? I, I would like to see people regain the ability to laugh at themselves. Yeah. I think there is great power um, because that takes the power from the bullies. Right. I agree. I think that's an understated point <clears throat> where by being able to laugh at yourself and 
laugh at your problems. Yeah. Comedy can be a healing tool. <laughs> and you wouldn't think that. You would think someone's making a joke about me. And certainly comedy can become toxic mm -hmm. where someone is bullying you with their comedy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you become just full on stepped on. Mm -hmm. But then there is also a layer of you're going to a comedy show and the person is doing crowd work and they pick you out yeah. and they make jokes about you. And while it may sting a little bit, you're kind of laughing to you're yourself. Because yeah. you're enjoying it. You're yeah. like, wow, this is actually really funny. Yeah, that's a good joke. And know? I'm enjoying this. So <laughs> there is healing in that. And because it requires nuance to figure out. Mm -hmm. And yeah. our social media digital world is devoid of nuance. It feels yeah. like we have grown an allergy right. to nuance yeah. that because of it, we can't have the comedy that maybe you would have right. if you were in China. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, we lose a lot of comedy, a lot of comedy that might be great. Just even America 30 years ago, right? There were a lot of fantastic funny things that today would be considered um offensive um and uh I, i'm still very much undereducated in in the culture here um but there, there <laughs> it entertained people back then and there wasn't this perspective of everything has to be negative you know everything has to be um i'm offended about this thing yeah i so, remember yeah. watching do you, did you ever watch a comedian <clears throat> don rickles I'm not sure. He would roast people all the time, yeah. but he would roast everybody <clears throat> in the room. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't matter what race you were, what religion you yeah. were, what you look like, tall, short. It, like he would just roast everybody, including himself. Great. And he did it with like a layer of love. I remember even seeing skits of him mm. saying like, I, I hate everybody, but I love everybody. Yeah. And because yeah. of that, I'm going to roast everybody. Yeah. And you could see that transcend the hatred. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and yeah. I worry that we might be losing on, on comedians like that yeah. because of their worry of staying monetized or right. not being, uh, or, or yeah. being canceled. Um, uh, to me, I think there's a, there is for me a very strong and distinctive kind of line. And this transcends culture. It's, it's the same in China, it's the same in the UK, it's the same here. And that's intention. You know, it's intention. Um, the comedy that intends to satirize something and uh, and laugh with people, um, in my eyes, I would enjoy that. Whereas the bad thing comes when someone has the intention to harm. Sure. Uh, so that I think that's universal. And it feels like most people would be <clears throat> sharp enough in a room to be able mm -hmm. to distinguish the difference between it too. Yes. Like if I you have know. one person get on stage and just be mean. Yeah. Oh, everyone would. You would know. It. Yeah. You would know in your heart. You'd be like, no, this sounds wrong. This mm -hmm. is not coming off well. And then if someone is doing it and everyone's involved and it feels like a yeah. engaging, bringing people in as opposed to pushing people right. out, I feel like that would be felt as well. It would, but because yeah. we're not feeling both, we've mm -hmm. lost our contrast mm -hmm. measuring stick of what is right. Yeah. Social media, man. <laughs> well, it's so funny that you say social media because you told me you yeah. went into this because you get to be your own boss. You get to create whatever content you want. Yes. And then on the same flip side, you told me you can't create the content you want because the audience and the algorithm demand yeah. something from you. Your comedy uh, abilities are, are uh, shifted because yes. you're not allowed to say certain things. Uh, they're contrasting well, thoughts. Oh, the, yeah. The, that's a very fair point. And yeah. all of them... I guess I valid. Like my, my comedy isn't restricted much. I'm. It's more restricted by uh, algorithm and mm -hmm. having to to um, do certain sketches, even though I I've run out of ideas or I'm burnt out with that sketch. Um, but the 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 conflict of <laughs> I was trying to please casting directors and now I'm trying to please an algorithm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yes, yeah. I am. And the, you know, the stakes are if I don't please the algorithm, I'll get no views and my income will drop, which it has many times. Um, but uh, that I very strongly would rather be in this side than the auditions. Why? Uh, because it's up to me, you know. Uh, every rejection has nothing to do with me. It's because their lead came back. It's because another actor is taller. So you feel like it's like the audience and the algorithm is more fair. Yes, it gives everybody a shot. Yeah, mm. um, more democratized. Definitely, definitely more democratized. And when you look at things like the amount of Asian roles available in Hollywood mm -hmm. uh, versus, um, well, this is a kind of a new thing, but how 
Asians have the, let's say opportunities, opportunities that Asian people, actors, have in Hollywood versus opportunities that Asian people have here, um, it is a lot more fair, I think, mm -hmm. for, for new media, where I can reach hundreds of millions of people by making good content. But as an actor, you really don't ever have that power. Yeah. yeah. I spoke to Cal Penn about this. Okay. Um, from, uh, if you've ever seen the movie, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle or Van Wilder. Oh, man, you, you're missing some American I'm sorry, cult I'm classics. Yeah, no, it's I'm okay. <laughs> but um, he is an actor that spoke about this yeah. and how it was hard for him to get roles and he would get typecasted. Mm -hmm. uh, he experienced racism in the casting room. I bet, yeah. Um, that they would constantly ask him to do an Indian accent, even yeah. if the role wasn't for an Indian role. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he it upset him. Mm -hmm. But then it also, as a catch-22, encouraged him to take certain roles that he wouldn't even want to take that were typecasted and maybe not good roles in terms yeah. of positioning uh, an Indian person in a, in a positive light because mm. it would ultimately get him to the place where he could get the roles that he would want. What's I your understand. take on that Catch-22? Because you sort uh. of did that when you were traveling to Kentucky and paying your own way mm -hmm. with the goal of, I'll take this yeah. role that's not paying me anything, lose money, yeah. because I might be the next Brad Pitt. Yes. Uh, I didn't land that, by the way. <laughs> I didn't land <laughs> okay. the Kentucky job. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the catch is that you have to give value. Uh, oh, there's two ways of looking at it. The, the being exploited and the race thing. Uh, I personally, I don't think I've had much of that. Uh, I might go up for roles that like need me to speak Mandarin or need me to play the piano or like do Kung Fu stuff. I don't see that as anything negative. You know, I, I, I yeah, I don't think there's any, any negativity that comes with that. So that's totally fair. Um, but on the work exploiting side, hmm, I don't quite like that part. What I mean by the work exploiting side is say I'm a production, I need to cast the lead actor mm -hmm. and uh, I invite 300 actors in. Each actor gives me maybe one hour of work, two hours traveling, so that's 900 hours that I've just asked for that I'm not paying anything and they get nothing out of it. Sure. I don't like that. Um, but I, it's a funny thing because the same kind of is with social media. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of people put thousands <laughs> of hours into making videos um, and uh, don't make money. Yeah. Uh, so the, the exploitation of work, yeah, I don't like it when it comes to auditioning because, you know, I'm a professional who has a, who, who got a bachelor's degree in order to do my professional work that I've worked for a few thousand hours a year for zero dollars. Um, but the other side, the content creation side, it feels more like I'm investing in a business that I'm building. Mm. Uh, and that it's fair. You know, it's not up to someone with power who likes a person. It's actually up to, do I make good work? It's interesting because, again, I'm going to keep pointing out these paradoxes yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> because they're interesting to me. You say that there's a lot of hours that are spent going to these auditions yes. and that the, the, the work exploitation on that level is bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you also told me that when you were doing that, mm -hmm. it was pleasant. But then now when you're in your own business yeah. and you have all these worries, you feel less healthy and more mentally stressed out than you did when you were casting. Oh, yeah. that I take that for granted. It's, I think it's a part of business that comes to every business. Right? Okay. So I take that for granted. But I think you raised a very interesting point with um, <laughs> when I was auditioning, how I was so hungry that I would... Um, be exploited, that I mm. would lose money Got for it. an opportunity. And I think the reason that is, the reason this whole industry of millions of people doing this mm -hmm. is because the demand and supply is just too bonkers. Yes. Like if there were a thousand actors, <laughs> every actor would get jobs. Yeah. But because there are millions and millions and millions of actors fighting for, you know, a hundred jobs, a thousand jobs, mm -hmm. um, that's what caused this, uh, this norm they're like, oh yeah, you were supposed to work for 30 years and never make minimum wage. Yeah. I think it's because of of that extremely overpowering demand. Yeah. How many and the unfairness work. comes from the selection of who gets to get those roles mm -hmm. from the gatekeepers of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, but then on social media, 
that there's like this also um, work exploitation where now if you upload content, you're not even a part of the YouTube partner program, you'll still get ads put on your videos. <laughs> That. Which is savage. I've no, it is kind of like <laughs> so. Yay. Like they're monetizing your content, yeah. and you're not even getting a piece of it anymore. Mm -hmm. That is a strange situation. Yeah. I, I don't know enough about that. To, <laughs> you're like, I'm yeah. not going to attack YouTube. They make me too gonna. much money. <laughs> YouTube gave me an opportunity. No, no, no. I, I, I'm not ridiculous. speaking badly about it. I'm no, just saying that yeah. this work thing is very tricky to figure out because. Mm. It's the same with medical school, where a lot mm. of people are pointing out on my social media that medical school is too competitive. Oh. They're saying it's too expensive, and that's the part I very much agree with. Like, cool. it doesn't need to be that expensive. We need yeah. to figure that out. But then they say it's too competitive. And then I start wondering, what does it mean that it's too competitive? If there's only a certain number of medical schools with only a certain number of slots, because we only need a certain number of doctors, yeah. then it's appropriately competitive. Yeah. If we need to make more then maybe the competition will become a little bit more fair, but we shouldn't arbitrarily lower the standards to becoming a physician. Do mm. you agree? Like just say, oh, you know what? Let's make it easier to get into medical school. Let's lower the requirements. That is such a strange thing. It's a dilemma. I'm not sure I fully understand. So people are demanding that because it is too, too hard to get in, mm. that they make it easier to get yes. in? Yes. What a strange concept. Yeah. And I'm, I don't I don't know if I vibe with it because it feels like it should be appropriately hard <laughs> to get in because it's a competitive field. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, okay. So so it's not about is it about the individual or the competition of pairing of uh, the competing Both. With the individual? I see. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> so you're so, like, I'm used to competing. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm used to, I have some stories to tell about that actually. Oh, uh, uh, tell me a story. I want to hear a story. Okay. So, so to answer the question first, hmm, I think it should be, it should, first of all, the, the most important thing is that you have professionals capable of delivering the help that people sure. need. Uh, you cannot sacrifice that mm -hmm. for the sake of easier entry to the profession. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, the other parts, i not educated enough to, to get a fair, fair. Get impression of it. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, in China, so uh, this is, China is a very, very competitive place where there are just a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people fighting for, for spaces. Uh, Although I, I just heard the population is the first year it decreased. Is that? A, I would believe that. Deaths yeah. to births, I think. Wow. Oh yeah. Well, one like my my generation don't have siblings, so mm. it's a it's a culture wide, nationwide kind of a impact that very much so. Yeah. Socially impact. Yeah, yeah. hugely. Um, so and that that perfectly leads into my experience being in China when I was twelve to 14, 15 years old, about fourteen and a half. Um, while I was there, I this is I just realized it'll be an interesting perspective for for Westerners. Um, while I was there, we were doing something called Chu Zhong, which is middle school, the first half. Okay. So typically, children are 13, 14, 15 years old mm -hmm. for this period of school. Um, and China is a developing country, and education kind of lasts until about when you're 14. Mm -hmm. Uh, then it stops. And if you want to continue education, you have to go to private schools. Mm. Uh, because of that, there is this massive competitive energy to get into the private schools. I'm from Shenzhen, which is one of the biggest cities with 12 million people. Uh, and while I was there, what I saw was an absolutely unreasonable amount of pressure on all the 14-year-olds to, to compete. And the number that I had heard at the time that continue on is less than a half. Wow. Uh, so that alone is, you know, it decides your life. It decides what kind of career you can have. It's very, very difficult in China if you don't have education to start a career like like I did in America. Mm -hmm. um, so you've kind of like this, <laughs> this, this permanent unbreakable barrier that you're you're stuck to terrible jobs, to labor probably work. Um, and there's one aspect that makes this way worse. And that aspect is that none of my generation have siblings, except very rare twins. So <laughs> for the boys, you are the only chance for your family to carry down their lineage. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. And on your shoulders rest your entire lineage to do well, to become a a, uh, respected person, to become a person of high social class. Um, So that's where the culture that I grew up in, the culture that I satirize all the time of like parents saying you have to get A's all the time, you have to Mm -hmm. play the piano. It's because of that. Wow. It's because all the parents are like, this is our, our only thing that will pass on the lineage. And it must be so stressful because now the health and well-being of your parents, once they get older, is on one person's shoulders <laughs> as opposed to distributed amongst multiple siblings. Yeah, my personal friends, um, they're complaining about this. It's hard enough as it is for a 25-year-old to get a job or, or a career um, in China currently. But each of them are experiencing, say a young couple gets married, they're in their 20s. They now have four parents of theirs and eight grandparents that will very soon need them to provide for. Mm. And that pressure is it's, it's very unfair. Yeah, I, This is what I hear from my friends who, who are in China. Wow. Um, yeah, so the boof, it's, a hard, it's hard to... Was that why your family that. decided not to stay? My mom. I mean, not the only reason, but one of the reasons. Yeah, my mom just wanted to move. Uh, I was not consulted (laughs) in this decision at all. (laughs) I was told, you come here. Okay, thanks, mom. What was the reason? Uh, Or do you know? She wanted to leave China. I think she wanted to see more of the world. She wanted to experience other stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, And at the time, my when I was four, my mother and father separated, Mm -hmm. and so I think you know she just wanted a fresh scene. To, to start anew. Got it. Uh, and the reason we went to Ireland was that was the only other country we had family. Mm. So we had a distant uncle in Ireland and that's why she went. Oh, interesting. Uh, she set up and eventually she married an Irishman who became my dad. Okay. And uh, I came over, I became Irish, immigrated, uh, and then grew up there. Wow. What an interesting story. <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot of... Uh, not a lo- and then why did you go back for the three years? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to face palm at this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a hundred percent true story. Okay, hundred okay. uh, percent. In 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 our culture, there is this kind of thing of authority. Mm-hmm. Um, I do what I'm told. Period. I don't ask questions. I don't say anything. If I'm told, um, I do with it. that being uh, from yeah. the Soviet family that I'm from. So yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So you would you would uh, relate to this. Uh, my uncle, who's my mother's brother, who was kind of like the the figure of authority in our family. He lives in China. Um, I'd been in Ireland for about two years. <laughs> That's how ridiculous stories. My <laughs> uncle came to visit, uh, and uh, when he visited me, he saw that I had, I was doing things like, for example, I would out kick a ball by myself with no one else there. I would just kick a football on a field. Okay. Or he saw me. He would, he would see me doing math homework, and because I saw every other kid did it, I would like count on my fingers. And he says, "Stephen is getting stupid. He's going to come back to China." <laughs> True story. <laughs> Translated word for word, Stephen is uh, getting stupid. He needs to come back to China. 100%. Wait, how does kicking a ball in the yard by yourself translate to being stupid? It's because to him, smart kids are doing calculus, not okay. kicking a ball in a field. Okay. And the math thing was, I get, okay, fine. It okay. looks dumb when you do this. It do, it's uh, fine. Yeah, it's, it's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. And so I went, okay. I did what I was told. I went where I went. Okay, and so, that. so I, I want to ask you this. Um, it's about the experience of, of immigrating to Ireland. And I believe it had a strong impact on me. When I first went to Ireland, uh, I was eight years old. And this is the story of the first day I was there. <laughs> Give you a sense of how like much of a tiger mom my mom is. Um, she she had been around for two years. And I hadn't seen her in a long, long time. Uh, so... <laughs> She comes to China. She gets me. We go on a plane for like 16 hours from China to Ireland. We land. Uh, we land precisely, I remember, so well because of emotion. No, damn it. This is <laughs> just a trauma that I still carry to this day. Uh, we landed at 8 a.m. My mom drove me to our house and she's like, this is the house you're going to live in now. I was like, whoa, okay, what's going on here? Um, uh, and uh, I met my stepdad. And I was like, uh, he's, he's my dad now. And then uh, she gave me outfit she just put this on i was like what okay i put it on and then she drove me to school and i was in school by 11 there was instant i was in school by 11 a.m from landing from landing exactly i will always remember that day and that was one of the most impactful moments of me because you could just say scarring or traumatic (laughs) because that's what that sounds like so here's the that's simple that's 
easy for for a fellow veteran like myself. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the hard part was I was dropped in an environment. My mom put me in the school, said to the principal, here's Stephen. Hello, hello. Okay, and then she left. There was not one person who could speak Mandarin in miles. Okay. And eight-year-old me. You spoke no, no English. Not a word. Okay. Not a word. Wow. My entire language was taken. And I and as an eight-year-old, I didn't have the social ability to go, Of course. Uh, 不好意思,我听不懂你说的话,让我Google <laughs> I didn't have that social ability. Yeah. Google Translate didn't even exist exist back then. So um, for the next like year, I became extremely introverted, and I I, I wasn't myself. I was a, a, a child who loved playing with other children, mm -hmm. I loved making friends, playing games, but because of that sink or swim situation. I became the child that was like sitting in the corner at lunch. Of course. In fact, I used to do this thing. It's really sad now that I think of it. <laughs> um, at lunch, I would. I would buy a sandwich and I would um, I would continuously walk around the school pretending that I had somewhere I needed to get to. Oh, I do that all the time. But there was nowhere I had to get to. Yeah. I just had to wait until lunch was over. Yeah. Um, so here's what I want to ask you. I think it's possible that the experience kind of stifled my social abilities for, for like, 20 years, 10 years, 20 years. 20 years? Wow. Yeah, okay. because I was just as introvert. I spent all of my teenage years in my bedroom playing a video game. There was like one friend I met every now and then mm -hmm. it was to play video games. Um, when I went to London, I I was such a introvert that I, I felt great anxiety going to any kind of party or anything. So again, I spent my entire bachelor's degree in my room. Um, and only, I'd say in the last, last five years, four years, <clears throat> I guess it could be because of the acting training too, that I had opened up and found comfort in talking to people and making new friends. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a theory that I have, but I want to hear your your take on it. Um, I to say that it stifled it is hard to say. Yeah. Uh, shifted. Okay. Pivoted for certain because you had to adapt to your yeah. circumstances and. Kids are really good at adapting and, and figuring things out, just like how you were smart enough to figure out to walk around with a sandwich. Did you so really no, do that? that, that yeah. Bro, that's I, crazy. I don't remember when I did that last, but the whole idea of walking around and pretending I'm going somewhere, yeah. I do that. Like, I, I think I still do that to this day. To, today, you do not need yeah, to do yeah, that. Yeah, but I do that. Like, that's just like a thing I do. <laughs> oh my God. Like, if, okay. I'm, if I'm early for something, I'm like, oh, like, this is not the right building. I'm going to walk around. But meanwhile, oh, okay. I know Casually. exactly where gotcha. I need to go, gotcha. but yeah. I just need to kill some time. Okay, so it's not out of like. So that strategy was a coping mechanism of. Yes, you yes, in the very moment. much. Um, did it impact you? Sure. Can we say that it was a negative thing? Hard to say. And um, I don't want to label it negative yes, or yes. positive. Yes, I am very, very grateful for the path because the, the fact that I can speak English to this ability, it's like. Phew. Yeah, how did you learn? <laughs> They put me in a special aids class um, for a year. Okay. But still, no one spoke Mandarin. So yeah, I exactly. Had no so, clue what was going on. So they would show you a picture and then say a word, I'm assuming. No, they didn't do that. They, oh, how did um, you, how did they communicate with you? I was, uh, I, I had a caretaker and I was in a group of, um, of mentally challenged kids. Uh, and uh, everything was kind of led. We were led to our kind of tables. Mm -hmm. We were led to the back of the room in mm -hmm. classes. Um, and I, didn't have anyone that explained it to me, but I, I picked it up through kind of watching. So like I, I see everyone else take out their red book. I take out my red book and gradually I learned what the words meant. Got it. Um, so, so just that, association. Yes, association. Do you feel like, I, and I know I was joking around about it earlier, yeah. saying the word traumatic, that there was a traumatic experience. Do you feel like it was a traumatic experience? Oh, there, there were a lot of discomfort, a lot. Um, there was a lot of sink or swim a lot of uh, anxiety. I don't want to go out. Mm -hmm. uh, like not okay. how you felt after yeah. the fact, but in the moment. In the moment? Yeah. <laughs> this is so funny. because Well, the no, because the reality is we have something known as ACE uh, in, mm. in the study of psychology and mental health, which is called adverse childhood events. And okay. we know that as the number of traumatic uh, moments in, in one's life increase, 
higher risk for developing other conditions increase as well. Right. And I'm not oh. just talking about mental health conditions. I'm talking yeah. about physical health conditions like feeling dizzy and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and feeling, uh, describing a traumatic moment, obviously you go to the worst things watching a loved one die, mm -hmm. um, like in a horrendous way, like yeah. your family member dies yeah. in your arms or um, something terrible, like a loved one mistreating you is mm -hmm. a big one. But coming to a new country, being thrown in a sink or swim situation, having no one to fend for you could be one of those, yeah. but it largely depends on the circumstances around it, which I'm not familiar with, and we mm -hmm. could spend hours discussing it. Mm -hmm. Basically, like, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you were put into that classroom yeah. and you knew you you can come home and talk to your mom and your stepdad about it, or dad, however yeah, you refer yeah. to him. I call him dad. Dad. Yeah. Um, about it, and you felt like they, you had their support. Mm -hmm. You might go into that classroom hating it, yeah, yeah, but knowing that you were still safe, and that feeling of safety might have prevented it from becoming a traumatic situation for you. Fascinating. Okay, but it all depends on what your mindset was at the time, uh, which is what therapy essentially <laughs> turns into: figuring okay. those things out. If that's something you choose to do with your therapist, I see. I. That's a great point, and I do have an answer for that. Um, I have a coping mechanism that has stayed with me for my whole life, and it's being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I I don't know if I did this purposely, but there there are many moments where I don't associate things. Like for example, when I'm going through the things. When I'm going through the anxiety and having to deal with the situation, mm -hmm. my mind does not go, I'll be cool later. I'll go home later. It kind of just numbs up mm -hmm. and I just go, okay, I'm here now. Oh, this is uncomfortable, but I'm here now. Mm -hmm. I'm here now. And I, I still do that. I yeah. Do many times where I'm in, oh, I'll give you an example. This is play terrible. I won't name any names, but um, I, I recently had a thing done where I needed to get stitches. Mm -hmm. uh, I needed to get stitches. And uh, the the operation, I did not get properly numbed. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I felt every bloody stitch. Oh, no. And my, I, I went into stupid mode again. I, I went, okay, oh, that hurts. Oh, that hurts. Oh, Instead uh, of stupid, let's call it something yeah. like this, you dissociated from the moment. Okay, yeah, but it was hard to not feel it. I felt every stitch. No, no, no uh, you felt it, but emotionally yeah. you weren't Emotion, Maybe, yeah. yeah. So what happened that was... I was like, okay, no problem, it'll end, oh, it'll end, and then 10 goes by, oh, it'll end, and then 20 goes by, I was like, how long will this go? And it was my girlfriend who who just just went, I was clenching my teeth, but I, like, I didn't say anything. Uh, my girlfriend was like, hey, how you doing? And I was like, yeah, this is quite painful. And this, the, the person who was doing the stitches was like, what, what, wait, why did you tell me? You could have told me like 20 stitches ago. Yeah. So that's an example of this this thing mm -hmm. that I, I close off and I go, I go, endure, endure. Sure. Uh, that's a sign that you could have had a traumatic <laughs> event because you developed a coping mechanism around it. And yeah. uh, it's a sign. Okay. It's not definite. And it's worth okay. exploring with a mental health professional because I think working with a mental health professional, even though it's really hard with our current system here in the US, it yeah. sucks and not everyone has access. Yeah. We need to fix that. But we all could benefit from it. Okay. Because we all have varying degrees of traumas and adverse childhood events. Some of them impact us more in certain ways that are positive, some of them negative, something yeah. somewhere in between. And figuring that out with someone who's objective is really helpful. And I don't okay. want to become okay. your therapist right now because that's not ethical and not ideal for uh, you. Yeah. But um, what I will say is that the idea of dissociating during hard times is yeah. not unique to people who have uh, gone through difficult moments like you have. I see. But okay. also it's just a natural human phenomenon. And I can even give you one that I can relate to myself. Okay. I had my... Uh, boxing match in on Halloween mm. and the person I was fighting against was significantly more skilled than my first fight. Mm. My first fight, I was happy to be there. I was excited. I was yeah. stoked. I was nervous yeah. and I felt all the nerves, but I was also excited. Yeah. And then for this next fight, because I was much more nervous or I was much more afraid of being nervous as a protective mechanism, my mind kind of dissociated from those emotions. Mm. But what happens and is problematic in a lot of these scenarios is when you blunt emotion, like what we do when we dissociate or you call playing stupid, yeah. we actually lose the ability to feel positive emotions as well. During that time or for a long period? Uh, a lot of times people dissociate for longer periods of time. And okay. when I say positive in that moment, 
For example, a positive emotion that moment for you could have been gaining the courage to say something. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. because you dissociated so hard, you didn't even connect to your positive yes, emotions. Yes, that's so. exactly what I've been yeah. talking about. Yeah, that's it. You just explained it perfectly. <laughs> yes. So for me, I couldn't summon up my nerves, yeah. which would have been good. Yeah. Because nerves and anxiety is your body preparing you for a challenge. Okay. So I didn't get to summon that nerves, those nerves. And as a result, I didn't perform as good as I could have had I not dissociated. Or uh, you, in your case with the stitches, did not speak up yeah. when you totally were with so a positive right. emotion. All it would have taken is a sentence. Hey, this hurts. And it would have gone away. And when I said that, it did go away because he, <laughs> he numbed me up more. <laughs> exactly. Uh, wow. That's Is there a name for that coping mechanism? Dissociation. Dissociation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. something we do kind of as a survival mechanism as humans. Wow. And that's why you frequently hear uh, like sexual assault victims will say, oh, uh, I froze up yeah. or I was like a deer in headlights and I didn't know what to do in that moment. That's almost like a mechanical form of dissociating oh my God. where you kind of okay. freeze up during those bad moments. Um, but we went really dark with that. Yeah. Um, but interesting, right? I, I could learn, I could really learn from this because there are many occasions where all it takes is like, I don't want to be here and I can get out of the, the, the painful or, um, or uncomfortable situations. Uh, <laughs> this I could tell, because this is a light little thing. Well, yeah, because yeah. It's, you, you actually have more control than your, body's, your mind is letting you believe you have. That's hilarious. But what was the story? So uh, two days ago, I think two days ago, oh my God, I went for my first facial because I'm making an effort to take care of my body. <laughs> okay. Fair, fair. I love it. Okay, this is great. So I, I went into the facial um, and I remember the person started popping my pimples. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, my eyes were covered, so I couldn't see what yeah. tools they used. But it was sore. It was sore. While it was going on? Yeah, the okay. popping, like the, yeah. the, the squeezing. It was very sore and it just kept going on and it kept going on and it kept going on. After the fact of enduring that for like 20 minutes, yeah. I said to my girlfriend, I was like, I don't think I'll ever do that again. It was very painful. <laughs> and then she said, why did you tell her to stop? <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, why didn't I tell her to stop? <laughs> yeah. It would have been so easy to say. Yeah, you know, this is also that. cultural uh -huh. because again, Chinese culture in respecting elders, yeah. in treating things in a hierarchy yeah. process is very similar in Russian culture. Okay. So I have the same situation. Like I've gone for a massage before <laughs> um, and I was getting a massage and it was way too rough. Okay. And I'm like, no, no, this person is like, they're trying. That means like they're doing something really powerful. Yeah. And the next day I couldn't walk because it was like, Christ. but again, I didn't need to. And now I'm trying to learn and say like, okay, it's okay to speak up. It doesn't yeah. mean you're spoiled yes. as long as you do it respectfully. Yeah. And I think that's a cultural shift that we need to sort of adjust wow, a little bit. I love that. That's a real it's piece funny that of value we have a lot of these. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I hear. I remember your stories from you tell them in your videos, like um, the way you grew up. Your dad made you memorize pages of a yes. book. That's hardcore. My social bro. studies textbook. I still remember it. And I would no start, way you still remember. Yeah, oh, I don't remember the words. Oh, okay. The, but the, I remember story, like yeah. reading the chapter yeah. about Native Americans or something, and I'm, uh, I'm memorizing it. He takes it. He's holding it, and I start off by saying the, hmm. and it was an, the first word. Mm -hmm. He hands me the book back. Go back. So and I was God. like, this is terrible. <laughs> yeah. But now I'm so grateful that he did that. Yes, yes. So I'm grateful that I went through everything I did. So as it's well. like, it's a good learning process because you constantly adapt one way or another. Mm. And uh, it, it's a cool process. My last question is going to be about how you manage your emotions now, okay. because now you have failure, failure oh, management wow. yeah. as your motto Boy. and as your brand. Yes. So how do you manage failure? Failure management is a funny thing. It started as a joke. You know, I was satirizing how like um, many times I would be called, hey, that's not good enough. Or that's not Because, you know, we our culture are very similar in the way that um, a parents has to hold up this tough persona of nothing's ever good enough. Right. Yeah. Mom, I won an Oscar. Why did then you win two? <laughs> nothing's ever good enough. Yeah. Um, and so it started off as a, as a piece of satire, as a, as a joke. But then I actually found power in the failures and the rejections. Mm. Um, I'm a very like logical and mathematical person. And I, I just I, I just thought about this one day. I was like, hey, wait a second. <laughs> it's really easy to win a one in a million lottery. All you have to do is lose a couple million times, <laughs> right? 
And I started thinking about this in a very large scale of everything I've been doing. Um, the rejections that I had gotten, the videos that I made that didn't work. And at the time I had gone on a journey of studying people who I admired. Um, there was an insight that just blew me away. And that is the people that I admired had failed way more times oh, than sure. I thought. Yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio on his sag after interview <laughs> says he was rejected for a year straight. That blew my head off. Yeah. Imagine you're a casting director and Leonardo DiCaprio walks into your room and you're like, nah. So that I was like, okay, wait a second. So it's not such a bad thing because all the people who have made it to great length have gone there. So that has taken power away um, from the, the negative rejections and the stuff. Cause it used to make me feel like I was lesser, yeah. like I wasn't good enough and stuff like that. Uh, which yeah, sometimes are true. I'd have to get better. Yeah, sure. Um, but now I wear it with pride. Mm -hmm. I don't fear failure anymore. I know if I try to do one thing, it's going to fail hundreds of times, but I'll pivot and I'll find the way. Um, so that, that emotion, I have no negative emotion and I wish, I, I wish this to, uh, I wish this insight to carry farther and, uh, de-villainize failure for more people as well, because it's not to be feared. Um, but the emotions thing, that's a great thing you mentioned that, because I have had extraordinary growth that has changed everything about my emotions, and it's because of acting, funny enough. Hmm. I went to a school called the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York City. It's actually the reason I came to the United States. Um, it's one of the best schools on the planet. And uh, while I was there, I learned more about myself a lot more. I learned why I am the way I am. Uh, and uh, I learned this concept that everything we experience, every piece of our lives, live inside us always. So even if you forgot the day you accidentally dropped your ice cream cone on the floor when you were six, it actually lives inside you and it works to affect the human you become. Mm -hmm. uh, and so gradually I started to understand myself. Oh, so this is why I, I feel... Um, anger because I fear because, you know, when I was six for two years, I would finish school and watch every other child get picked up by their parents and I'd walk home by myself. Mm -hmm. um, so upon, so essentially what kind of the neighborhood playhouse teaches you to do is first to learn your instrument. Uh, and that was massively impactful. I learned why I am the way I am. Mm -hmm. I learned why I feel every emotion I feel. And then the other side of the acting is to use it as a, as a professional skill. Mm -hmm. And particularly the Neighborhood Playhouse teaches the miser technique, which is a much healthier way to do it, I think, um, because it's not using your trauma, it's using imagination to things that are not real. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, once you know yourself enough, you can execute and uh, cry on take 20 takes in a row, for example, like things like that. And be able to that? let it go. Yes, I can do No that. way. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to make you cry. In the 20 part. takes in a row. I did that once for a film. It was only wow. a little bit ago. Um, but that process, the, the acting process, now understanding, like uh, my dad said this thing to me. It, <laughs> over the last year, there was a person I was very angry at. Very angry. Because I believed they wanted to exploit me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I would shout. I, I would be very like aggressive. Um, and then my dad told me, it's just you. I was like, what, what, what are you talking about? It's just me. And he said, oh, it's, it's, they're pushing your buttons, but it's your buttons. And so I was like, whoa, wait a second. So you're telling me the reason I feel this anger, um, is because of insecurities that are either poking at sensitive spots that I have to defend with the anger mm -hmm. or stuff like that. After I realize I look at everything differently now, like any time I feel any negative emotion, I go, it's me. Now, where's that button and why is it there? Wow. And by realizing that, it completely disarms the power of the anger. I mean, your level of insight is like 100 right now. <laughs> You're like, where is my 100, sensitive? Yeah. yeah like <laughs> If you were Pokemon and you yeah, had an yeah. insight <laughs> skill, it would be 100 out of 100. Right now. Evolved to the final four. Yeah. <laughs> because most people don't do that. Uh -huh. um, whether it's they don't know how, they're not disciplined to, um, they're hurt so much further that they're incapable of doing that in the given moment. Because mm. in reality, 
we, we all could get to that point, but it's hard. Cool. We have to put a lot yeah. of our egos on the side. It is the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I, I genuinely, I wanted, I meant harm to a person who hurt me very much. And that's mm -hmm. what was why the anger. And to disarm that anger is the hardest thing I've ever done. Sure. <laughs> and it all comes from your successes in balancing your failure, yeah. celebrating your failure, building up confidence off of those failures, mm -hmm. and then seeing all these things play out and how you have better control over your emotions so that you trust yeah. yourself to make those decisions. Yeah. Because it seems I, like you trust yourself now, right? I, what do you mean? Like, like to make that decision to say, yes, this person's angry or I'm angry at this person, yeah. but why? I trust myself enough to figure it out. Because a lot yeah. of times we won't have faith in our ability mm -hmm. to know the truth. Yeah. That maybe emotionally we're reasoning and are not being objective, but it sounds like you you're, can, right. you're capable yes. of being quite objective. Oh, uh, there is a there is a very famous Chinese poem, and it starts off with these six letters um, that are so profound. It just uh, it took me this long to understand it. It's 人之初性本善,性相近,习相远, and it describes all humans are born good, although your experiences might defer your nature is good mm -hmm. uh, that is the perspective that allows me to look at a person who i'm angry at and go oh damn if i'm in their position i'll probably do the same thing <laughs> yeah so that that's was, charitable thinking charitable you're doing thinking. you're doing all of the psychological terms that we <laughs> oh would God, we I would discuss know. in therapy you're naturally organically doing it which is great that's crazy it's very powerful Thank you very much. Yeah, so well done on that. Oh, yay, growth. <laughs> and today I, I'm going to I'm going to think about the disassociation thing more. Yeah. Because there are just uh there are just situations where I don't need to endure stuff. I and would say. I will say despite you having a 100 out of 100 insight level, working with a mental health professional goes yeah. so far in being able to bounce ideas off of hmm. to have a non-judgmental person who is completely devoid of emotional reasoning in the moment yeah. because they're not experiencing the same emotions you yeah. are or were, that they can help facilitate your internal dialogue. That's fascinating. Yeah, interesting that's stuff. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, that's why we cheers to failure management 2020. Cheers. <laughs> 2023. Sam, should we do the come. lightning round? Let's do it, baby. All right, lightning round. Oh, okay, okay. Lightning round. These are okay. going to be fast. Okay. So we can get you out of here and you don't have to hate us for <laughs> keeping you so late. Oh, no, I'm good. Okay. Which character that you've played, whether it be on stage or one you've created on camera, would live the longest? <laughs> wow, these are these are hard for a fast fast lightning round. Which character I've played plenty of characters would live the longest? I think I have to go uh, fictional Steven. Okay. Fictional Steven that gets roasted all the time. Okay. I think it's him. Okay, shortest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this, this is pop quiz. There's an actual answer for this. It's I played a I I played a character in um, Spring Awakening called Moritz Stiefel, and uh, if you know the play, he does not survive till the end. <laughs> yeah, okay. Moritz Stiefel. Yeah. Um, what's one thing you could do if you could never get hurt? What's one thing I could do if I could never get hurt? Yeah, like if I say you'll never get hurt doing this, what would it? Oh, what would you want to oh, do? okay. In reality, no no superpowers or anything. Mm. I can't well, the fly. superpowers that you won't feel any pain or you won't have any, <laughs> you won't get hurt. That's a superpower. But only okay. for that okay. one activity. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think I would go into boxing. Really? Yeah. No way. If I don't get hurt, because that's my main concern. I just don't want injuries. But you, you, would, you would like to box? Yes, I think it would be quite wow. fun. I think you would. Kind of want to take you into a boxing room and train <laughs> you up a little. If I ever go, I'll be with you, Doug. Creator right? Clash 3. Okay. Okay. Uh, what's one thing that your body does that not everybody else's body does? Besides form stress cysts. <laughs> My body's like, yeah, I've got plenty of that, whatever you want. One. I move well for being a, a thicker guy. Okay. I think I move well. Okay. We're going to find that out in the boxing room. <laughs> Have you uh, ever almost died? Have I ever almost? Yes, yeah. There are a few experiences I could distinctly Whoa. remember. Okay, give me one. Uh, oh boy, I didn't have parental controls for most of my life, so <laughs> so I was in many situations where okay. I almost died. Uh, I'll give, uh, 
So I'll tell you, here's some of the easy ones. I remember once riding a bike on a very narrow uh, sidewalk, right? On a road, cars go by, there's mm -hmm. a sidewalk. Yeah. I was riding the bike and um, there was a pole directly in my way and mm -hmm. things like this narrow. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was like, okay, how am I get? And I was speeding. How am I going to get? And a car was coming right at me at the perfect timing. I managed to, to execute one of these cluck, cluck. And then I, I ducked the pole and came back. I couldn't and turn. And ducked the car. And ducked the car. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's an example. Uh, when I was young, I was, I tried a lot of stuff because there were no, no parents telling me not to. Sure. So I, I went to um, internet bars. Can I, can I say this? Yeah, so say it. Like I went to internet bars when I was 13 and uh, there were, that was not a good place to go. It was the, the not legit ones. It was the... <laughs> The scammy but, ones. But behind many alleyways, someone's Fair. basement ones. Okay. And in that place, I saw many drug deals go down, many illegal activities go down. And uh, it's a miracle that I managed to stay out of any of it. Wow. I, was, I, I props for that. And you were 13? Myself. I was 13. What's one thing you spend way too much money on? <laughs> I think I know the answer to that one. <laughs> oh, Way too much money on big ticket. I'm a watch collector. Yeah, exactly. We're both watch, watch collectors. Yes, we were just yeah. romanticizing about romanticizing, that. Yeah. Um, which country is funnier, China or Ireland? Oh, Ireland. Why? Oh, bro. I thought you were going to say China for sure. <laughs> That's because I satirize. <laughs> but like the thing is, Chinese humor is quite restricted. Okay. Um, and life is harder. So so not many people are, are as up for laughing. Okay. Whereas Irish people are very, very free. Okay. And uh, they're goofy. I think that's where I got my goofiness from. Okay. Do you have a personal health hack or tip that you love? Oh, great question. It's maybe misinformation. So please listen <laughs> to Dr. Mike. Please listen to Dr. Mike. I like being upside down. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna be Are there whips and, and leather outfits involved? Because no, 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 then I don't no, want to know. No, no. So uh, let me let me paint the picture. When I was young, outside of my house, there was a cloth hanging pole, metal, very okay. strong. I used to, oh, I, was, I was a kid back then. I used to love climbing out the pole. It was like a monkey bar thing. Yeah. And you know, it's hanging hey, off of Yeah, it. we like that. I love that. And you I still do that? I, I don't have anything to hang off of anymore. I know what I'm getting you for the holidays. <laughs> it's a shame but, your birthday just passed because I yeah. would have gotten you this as but a yeah, I, inversion I, I, table. Yes. Or, or the thing that, you know, in the gym, you the hook your legs up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I love that. I love hanging off of the bed. Okay, I'll just, get you this. <laughs> Is that healthy? I don't want to. I don't want to tell the camera anything. People shouldn't do. It, you love it. It's healthy for you. That's, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> no medical claims to be proven or disproven. Here. Thank you. Okay. Here's the actual, real truth about sparkling water. Click here to check that out. And as always, stay happy and healthy.